I'm going to talk today about a, a new theoretical framework that I have been working on with a lot of colleagues of mine really across the country or across the world. Uh, some Americans, some Brits, was a Dutch, uh, and also a, a Canadian, Eric um, or Rakesh Jetley, for those of you who may know him. So this is kind of the equivalent of a sort of an English-speaking NATO participants. We threw the Dutch in there. As you all know, the Dutch probably speak better English, certainly than the Americans do. So we tried to have it in a way that we had some shared uh, um, understanding of what terminology means. So given that this is going to be a theoretical presentation, we should appreciate that it's probably wrong, okay? But that's not going to deter us because we think it will help move us a little bit further forward. And as you can see from the title, I'm going to try to make this argument that moral injury emerges as a result of a disruption in character. And this is a new way of thinking about moral injury. Others have alluded to it. But I think the value in this approach, just to give you the punchline, is it moves us away from a psychiatric illness framework. And for any psychiatrist in the room, psychologists, social workers, great, none of you should care about that. But folks in the field do care about this. So all of the folks before that Megan Thompson talked about, Brett Litz, Jonathan Shea, psychiatrists, clinical psychologists, etc. I'm a psychologist by training myself, but that doesn't mean everything that we encounter needs to get a disorder label to it, doesn't mean you're mentally ill, doesn't mean you need to be in therapy. Now, it could also mean that you do need to be, all right? So we just need to kind of keep both of those ideas open. So next slide. So this, I think many of you have, have seen some of these quotes. This is Jonathan Chase, his Achilles in Vietnam. Anybody read this book? Okay, this is a classic book, and it's a real page turner. So if you like thrillers, I mean, this one you could read very, very quickly. It's very, very well written. Um, but these are, are quotes taken from the, the preface to the book, so you don't even have to get very far into it to, to get some nice quotes. But war changes you, strips you of all your beliefs, your religion, takes away your dignity. These are obviously quotes from Vietnam uh, veterans from the from the U.S. that Jonathan Shea had in group session. I look, I look back today and I'm horrified at what I turned into. Okay, so the idea is, is that it challenges who we think we are. Next slide. Here's another book, uh, The Soul Repair. No one truly recovers from war. No one is ever made whole again. But we recognize the face that we have injured our moral being and core. So again, you see this sort of theme developing about fundamentally changing who you are as a person. Next slide. So here are some definitions. And I'm not going to go through all of these definitions other than to point out that most of the definitions of moral injury actually contain the word moral in the definition. And many of these definitions, and in particular the definitions by Litz and Brock and Latini, these are really written almost like a mental health diagnosis definition. So for those of you, I know none of you are mental health experts, but if you look at sort of how terminology is defined, it's this uh, lasting psychological, biological, spiritual, behavioral, social, right? perpetrating, failing to act, witnessing, learning about, deeply held moral beliefs. So you can see that the definition of moral injury contains the word moral, right? And I always, and I was saying this last night, that one of the things we learn, I think in second or third grade, is you never define a term by using that term in the definition, right? And so when you see people doing that, it means that they're probably themselves not sure how to define the term moral, right? Because that's the term that's never defined. All of these other terms is almost how the old definition of post-traumatic stress disorder. Like what is the trauma? It's witnessing, doing, experiencing, learning about. It's around trauma. But 
all of that aside, moral injury is really defined from a biopsychosocial spiritual perspective. Okay, so this is sort of for any social workers in the room, this is kind of the framework that social workers use to try to understand and help people who are struggling through finances or mental illness or family issues. You kind of have this kind of holistic approach to things. Next slide. And when you look at the current interventions for moral injury, there are kind of three main approaches that folks have taken. One is traditional psychotherapies for treating post-traumatic stress disorder. So you'll hear folks like Edna Foa, who developed prolonged exposure therapy, or Patty Riesick, who developed cognitive processing therapy, say that if you do my, inter my psychotherapeutic intervention, that will take care of the moral injury. So this is things that they have argued. I don't think they've argued it in print. I've only heard them argue that in conferences, so I'm not sure exactly what that means. Then there are other folks like Litz and Bill Nash and others who think you, knew, you need to do a clinical add-on. You need to do a module focused on addressing moral injury. And then there are others who really have taken a completely different approach. and They've taken sort of this spiritual component that, that I referred to earlier and so you have to do a, a spiritual component to help them derive meaning from the experience. So these are kind of the three basic approaches, none of which have been validated, by the way. But I, I want to highlight them anyway, because it, there have been arguments that these will help you recover from moral injury. Next slide. So the question I always have is, what happened to the moral and moral injury? If the idea is that that it's a now a moral injury, which is something different, say, than post-traumatic stress disorder. What exactly are we talking about addressing? Next slide. So when you look at some of the definitions of ethos or moralis, what you see sort of underlying these meanings is the word character. So character is an important part of the ethos pertaining to individual character or disposition, or moralis pertaining to character or temperament proper behavior of a person within society. And these are some of the definitions that, that Megan Thompson presented earlier about what is it we're talking about. And so what informs one's character? So when you think about folks who have deployed, so how many have deployed anywhere? Iraq, Afghanistan, okay, excellent. Most of the time, folks will talk about if you've suffered from a mental health issue or a physical health issue, they will also at the same time report having grown in, and become more sensitive to things that are important in life. How many would that describe you, that you learn things that are important, you learn things that aren't so important as a result of deploying? Show of hands. How many would say that? Yeah, that's very, very common. Now, that doesn't sound like a mental health illness to me, right, saying that i appreciate things in life that I didn't appreciate before. Does anybody, does everyone agree that does not sound like a mental health issue? Okay. So the question is, well, how does that happen? What is the mechanism of this sort of increased awareness, increased appreciation for things that you really didn't appreciate before? All right. So what informs, one of the things we thought, well, we're really talking about a, ch a fundamental change in one's character. So next slide. So when you look at sort of these, these virtues or the building blocks of character, right? So we view sort of virtues. And, and in some sense, you know, and we could have a, an offline discussion about whether it's a virtue, whether it's a value. But how does that inform character? How does that inform who you are? And there's lots of things that impact on character, such as society, your family, your education, religious institutions, and also the military. Now, why does the military, why is the military unique here? Because they're one of the few organizations that actually make at the study of ethics, the study of values or virtues. In the military, we call them values, but oftentimes they're actually virtues, but we don't need to discuss why that may or may not be important. But the idea is there are military virtues, and there are different virtues at every level. 
So if you think about what is it that individuals' virtues they should have, if you're a leader, is there another set of virtues or a hierarchical set of virtues that become important? And then organizationally, what's important? And oftentimes when organizations establish, you know, their virtues or their values, it's usually nested within the concept of what's the purpose of the organization. And within the U.S. military, I would, I would argue this is true for every military, the most important thing is victory. Now, you could say it's victory with dignity or dig victory with something else, but we'd all agree that the purpose of a military is to fight and win our nation's wars. It can do other things. It can do peacekeeping missions. It could do humanitarian missions. It could engage in disaster relief missions. It could train a whole group of the sector in a particular skill. It could help elevate socioeconomic status among some groups. But that's not why it exists to do those things. It exists really to fight and win your nation's wars. And everything usually is structured around being able to do that. And then the virtues and the things that the organization values then should support the accomplishment of that mission. Now, some could say, well, yes, but the military exists within a civilian society, right? We all agree that militaries exist within civilian societies. But in many countries, in particular in the U.S., the military is really a culture within the larger American culture, right? So when I was in uniform, we would talk about civilians. We would talk about them versus us, right? It was a very, you know, I joined the military. I'm sacrificing for the good of the country. People who don't join the military, they're dirt bags. They're writing off the hard work and freedom that I'm allowing them to enjoy, right? This is how the U.S. military talks about it. I don't know if Canadians talk about it in such a derogatory way. Americans are really more like that, I think, than other countries. But the idea is we are unique and special, and we have a unique and special place in our culture, right? That's the idea. And most military folks have that, whether you're still in the military or not, you serve, these other people didn't serve, me serving makes me better than those who didn't serve, right? It's almost this kind of hierarchical structure. Next next slide. So when you look at I'm not going to go through all of these, but Peterson and Sligman, many probably have heard of positive psychology. These are sort of the two inventors of this concept, and, and they have this whole taxonomy of virtues that you can look up, you know, from the good virtues to the bad virtues. And these are just some of the things that you look at. But virtues, they describe as core characteristics. Okay, Again, you see that word character emerging. And then they also talk about that virtues is an acquired skill. So virtues are things then that you could learn. This is an important point I'll return to later. right? So most people think of character as just something you either have or you don't have. It's either positive or negative. You either value this or you don't value that. But I would argue that organizations like the military have this deliberate attempt to instill values or virtues in its members. And here they are on stage. For those of you who didn't know the, I guess, just three, uh, three values, some virtues in there too. It's not important whether they're values or virtues, but sort of that unifies the group thinking around how we should behave. Next slide. So when you look at the literature, and again, I won't go through all of this uh, because these slides will be posted online and you can study this later or not. But character has different kinds of meaning from the virtuous character, right? So I always think like Mother Teresa. I always think of someone who's dead when I think of virtuous. I never know of a living person I would call virtuous. They're probably, you know, maybe a little bit further down. All the way to kind of like these beastly characters, right? The beastly character, people become enslaved desires, emotion, habits. So there's definitions of these. Usually we think of like Hitler, or Mussolini. Some people even think of our current president that way. But really, and there's in between. So it's not... Either you're great and virtuous or you're beastly. There's in between. And you can move around on each one depending on each decision you make. Okay, so it's not an all or nothing. You could move up or down. 
One decision you may make will sound be virtuous, and another time you're vicious. And we call leaders like that unpredictable, right? This leader's unpredictable. You don't know what they're going to do, right? It's because you can't kind of pigeonhole them to know exactly how they're going to behave. Next slide. So when you look at the literature on virtues and character and identity, all of a sudden you see this, this idea emerging that character, virtues, and identity are interrelated, okay? The key here in all of these quotes is these philosophers have argued that these constructs, these concepts are interrelated. Next slide. So how do you get there? Well, generally, it's believed that your virtues, your values, a standard of right, a particular moral excellence, informs your character. It informs that complex of mental and ethical traits that defines who you are as a person. And your character then becomes your identity. I mentioned earlier in the military, me versus them, us versus them. Okay, then you start identifying yourself. Are you a airman? Are you a soldier? Are you a marine? You even see this within the military, all right? So even within the military, we have the us and them mindset. Your identity is as a soldier. Then when you leave the military, you're just kind of a global veteran, all right? But it's your identity, much like your identity as a parent, your identity as a man or a woman, identity as a mother or a father, Identity as a professor or a preacher or a chaplain, right? So we have multiple identities simultaneously. And the idea is which one is dominant and in which context. So one of the things when you look at some of these identity formations within the military, what research shows is that more folks are likely to identify as a military person over their race gender, or ethnicity. This is how dominant the military identity can become in one sort of thinking. Next slide. So what happens to character and identity when we fail to uphold our values and virtues? So if we define who we are by sort of what we do, what happens to that? Next slide. So this, this work is bar borrowed from uh, Goffman, and he talks about these sort of three key um, behaviors and moral meaning, and we've added a fourth one. Now, no evidence for, for any of these really other than kind of thinking about them in a categorical way. So when you tell white lies, right, that's a moral slip, right? So what's an example of a white lie? Well, when my wife asks me, do I think she's gained weight? And I think maybe she has, but I say, no, absolutely not, right? That's a white lie, right? And so that's, I've compromised my my morals right there, right? Because I, I lie. But we all do that, right? We call that a moral slip. We call that identity. I have this speckled identity now. I'm not always honest with my wife, right? And most would say, what's well, a good thing to or you wouldn't have a wife, right? But then there's could be this moral stain. And the example we give is embezzlement. Someone who steals money, steals money from old people's retirement accounts, right? Those kinds. We say that person has a character flaw. Or in Gottman's words, they have this spoiled identity, which can affect the character and possibly their clinical domain as well. Okay, you could be depressed about it. Geez, I can't believe I did that. Okay, so then you're talking now, you might need help. Then we then the, the thing that most people talk about though around moral injury is this war trauma. So that could be a moral injury that can lead to character breakdown. You could feel disgraced didn't act appropriately, and that can influence both the character and the clinical domains, right? So both your character has been compromised, and you may also have a clinical issue to deal with depending on the nature of the trauma. And certainly sexual assault we, it fits into that category as well. And then there's this other one that we added, and that's when you have continuous acts of moral failure. And we say that's really moral decay or your altered character, you have this distorted identity. And these are the types of people that we generally put in prison for the rest of their life because we don't think it's safe for society to have them around us. So, and we can 
talk more about that in the discussion if folks are interested. But we think this is an example probably where no amount of clinical care is going to be helpful. It's just who they are. They're that aberration, maybe the one out of 100 million that we need to lock up. Next slide. So something needs to be said about post-traumatic stress disorder because I started off by saying that the current definitions that we have that we're working with really look like they're based on the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Health Disorders. That's what the DSM stands for. And we're in version 5. So if we're in version 5, that should immediately tell you we didn't get there in one move. It took us at least four other moves to get here. And you can see from this, and I'm not going to go through all of this, but what I wanted to convey is the, di the diagnosis for post-traumatic stress disorder is extremely complex, okay? Extremely complex. There are five different criteria. Uh, and if you, I always ask sort of a, when I'm with mental health folks, how many symptoms and reactions are associated with PTSD? Anybody know? You can try to count these. I cannot ever get the same count twice when I do it because some of these look, well, is that one or two? Is that a different thing? There are a whole bunch of them. Anywhere between 25 and maybe up to 40 odd different symptoms and reactions that have to fit within all of these deals, one of these, two of those, two of those, one of those kinds of things. So it's very complicated. And we we'll use it shorthand for anyone who struggles returning home from deployment. Ah, oh, it's a PTSD. Well, let's take a look, right? So you have to look at this. In the next slide, just to even make it more complicated, has criteria duration, functional impairment, uh, and the symptoms can't be due to medication substance use. Then we have two specialized categories, uh, dissociative specification, which kind of is... Think of it as kind of out-of-body experiences that after, actually a lot of soldiers report while they're engaged in combat, which is interesting, but this is like post-combat. And then this derealization, that things aren't real, they seem at a distance, and then delayed specifications. Okay, so you would think that with all of this, that there's this fine art to understanding post-traumatic stress disorder, but really it tells you how confused sometimes the definitions of post-traumatic stress disorder can be. And what I also add that there's a huge cultural component to it. So early on, for example, in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, our clinicians were really diagnosing many of our service members with depression not with post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, why do you think that was? It's because our clinicians had no experience diagnosing anyone with post-traumatic stress disorder. So they understood depression. The symptoms are very, very similar to depression. In fact, one of the symptoms is depression in PTSD. So, and then once they became educated, about how to diagnose for post-traumatic stress disorder, then post-traumatic disorder diagnosis went up. Now, did the symptoms of the service, the combat veteran change? No, they were the same. But all of a sudden, the prevalence rate goes up. So I share this with you so oftentimes when you see prevalence rates, it's really important to understand well, what do our clinicians know about these, these diagnoses? Is it an artifact of what our clinicians know, or is it actually truly what's happening symptomatically amongst the service members? Okay, next slide. So from this discussion, what we came up with was, one, here's PTSD, which, we, which clearly is a mental illness. But PTSD is a mental health problem that some people develop, and the key word there is some, after experiencing or witnessing a life-threatening event like combat, a natural disaster, a car accident, or a sexual assault. You won't see this definition written anywhere 
I came up with this definition because I think this sort of encapsulates it. But do you see a lot of this experiencing, witnessing? Where did you see that before? With moral injury earlier, right? With Litz and Shay's definition. Here we define moral injury as a failure to adhere to a virtual or value that results in needless suffering or death that threatens one's character and identity. So we really view it more as a insult to one's views of how they view themselves. Am I that kind of person that allows these kinds of things to happen? So it could happen or that I could do these kinds of things. So you saw some of the quotes earlier. I can't believe I could become that person. But when you're trying to survive on the battlefield, if you're trying to prevent someone from killing you, we do things that we normally wouldn't do when we're back home moving around in what we call the civilian world, right? Next slide. So we've got this stick diagram here that looks very complicated, and it is. We have arrows going everywhere. And we have arrows going everywhere because we're not really sure yet where, what arrows we can remove, which ones we got right, and which ones we got wrong. But the point that I'll try to make a few points in, there's some slides that sort of develop it. But we believe it all begins with an event. And one of the things that's important to understand with post-traumatic stress disorder, it's one of the few mental health diagnoses that you have to have a traumatic event. Okay, so there must be a known event that leads to that whole slide with all of those criteria and symptoms. So like schizophrenia and depression, there doesn't have to be an event, a known event. But, but for PTSD, there does. And we believe also... Uh, moral injury takes that pathway as well. And we propose that there are two pathways. There's an illness pathway that an event can trigger that can lead to post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, eating disorders. All of these things are known in the literature. And that could lead to possible changes, not always. But we also think there's this character pathway that can also be activated. And this character domain is something that influences your values and can influence your identity, both your personal identity and your social identity. And these things can lead to possible changes. And they can interact. Or you can have both pathways being activated simultaneously. So some of the work that Megan Thompson reported earlier suggests that it looks like both pathways may have been activated, both a mental illness pathway that leads to post-traumatic stress disorder and the pathway in the character domain that could lead to a moral injury. And they can interact and reinforce each other. This is what we're proposing theoretically. So treating one in one domain, say if you you say I have a moral injury and you're treating me with a psychotherapy that's designed to address post-traumatic stress disorder, I'm not going to get better, right? Because it's, it's in a different pathway. I might show slight improvement because as we show here, the, these domains do overlap, but it's unlikely to be successful in helping me fully recover. And what does the literature show? It shows exactly that. Combat veterans are less responsive to traditional psychotherapies than non-combat related traumas. So this theory would actually explain the theoretical rationale for that difference and lots of other ones. So it also hints at resilience issues. So it hints at one way that you grow, appreciate, things in life that you didn't appreciate before is happening not through the illness domain, but through the character domain. Okay. So now it's not just because it's character doesn't mean it's all positive because I just showed you can be your character and who you are, your identity can be challenged. And unless you can reconcile that dissonance, that could lead to moral injury, could lead to suicidality, and other bad outcomes that 
then would loop you back, if you will, into the illness domain. So these are not independent, but they interact. But, but the treatments need to focus on the pathway that's being activated. Next slide. So just some kind of key points in terms of the events themselves. We propose that the event can be traumatic or non-traumatic. So with post-traumatic stress disorder, it must be a traumatic event by definition. Okay, it's not my definition, that's the diagnostic statistical man. What I'm saying is that you can also have a non-traumatic event that can impact the character domain. A classic example of that would be, and this is a, a, a client that I had, he, Vietnam veteran, 40 years later, he talked about when he was out in the jungle, they were ambushed, a few of his friends were killed, one of them was a very close friend. They wrapped them up in their ponchos because they didn't have body bags. Since it was raining, the choppers couldn't come in to extract the body, so they had to wait you know, for the weather to improve. And while they were waiting, they were using these dead bodies as chairs to sit on to stay out of the wet grass. And 40 years later, he goes, what kind of person sits on his best friend's dead body? Now, there was no traumatic event there. The traumatic event had already happened. His event was treating another person, his best friend, as a chair. Still bothered him 40 years later. I would argue that's a moral injury that occurred because it affected his identity, who he is, not only as a soldier, but as a friend. What kind of friend does that? Okay, the event may be single or multiple. So you can have an event or single event. It's the series of events and it's single series of behaviors that just defines our identity. Not one event, but multiple events. It may be military specific, but it could also be civilian specific. So a lot of the discussion you, you see in the moral injury area is focused solely, almost exclusively, on the military. Like only the military can have moral injuries. But we'd, I'd argue that there's civilian examples. For example, a mother who's pregnant, knows she's pregnant, yet continues to take drugs. And then the baby turns out deformed as a result of taking the drugs. There's no trauma there, but what kind of mother does that, right? It's now, it's an insult to her as an identity as a mother. Okay, this is a civilian example. There's lots and lots of other civilian examples too. I just think we need to be thinking moral injury is not unique to the military. It's predominantly a focus of the military because of all the traumas that you are exposed to being in the military. Okay, but it doesn't make it necessarily so. And you can also have moral injury events in your daily work where you have a supervisor who's being cruel to a fellow worker and you don't say anything. What kind of fellow worker are you if you don't got my back? Why didn't you speak up during the meeting and protect me? How many of you have been in meetings like that? You have to raise your hand. But I've been in a lot of meetings like that. All right, and that can also affect your identity and who you are and what kind of a person you are. It's not in the extreme cases, but it moves us down that path of these moral slips to get becomes defining who we are. Next slide. So ways of moral injury may arise. So when a person becomes aware of aspects of themselves which they have not thought possible, this may include the capacity to do nasty things or to observe nasty things without feeling the need to intervene. So another example of a non-traumatic event, again, a soldier I was talking to. So this soldier had seen a lot of combat in Afghanistan, had not close friends, but members of his unit blown up and killed. He retrieved their body bag, you know, the body parts, put them in the, in the body bag. So coming to the, oh, well, that's probably what's bothering him. He's got post-traumatic stress disorder from all these combat experiences. No, that didn't bother him. Now, that's another issue, right, that none of that bothered him, I would argue, but none of that really bothered him. What really bothered him was the next day, he was really angry about the insurgents blowing them up and not doing the fair fight, come out and fight kind of thing. And there was this little boy 
who was asking for candy. So we all know little kids bake for candy. Americans do it too. My kids bake for candy all the time. So this is like a universal uh, behavior, little kids begging for candy. And he had just eaten a Snickers bar. And he'd eat, he had opened it in a way that it looked like there was still the candy bar inside it. And he handed it to that little kid. And the little kid took it, big smile on his face. You know, he's getting candy. And when he grabbed it, as he's driving off, he looked and he saw the look of extreme disappointment. And this little kid, we realized it was an empty wrapper. And his thought, what kind of person does that to a little boy? That was what was bothering him. That's, to me, a moral injury, not post-traumatic stress disorder due to all of these other traumas. Now, it took me many sessions to get that out of him. So this isn't something that veteran service members offer up immediately. Oftentimes, they tell the therapist what they think is, quote, socially acceptable for the therapist. Because, you mean, you saw all of this, that's not bothering you, but you hand a kid an empty candy wrapper and that's what's bothering you? Because he didn't think that was, and it only emerged when we started having a conversation about character, identity, who you are. I wasn't using the word moral injury. He goes, well, I did something I was really embarrassed about. So oftentimes you'll see it being guilt, moral injury. Some folks have defined it as guilt plus one of these other symptoms. But I will tell you, it can also be shame. It can be a predominant shame, embarrassment, extreme embarrassment. I'm not sure if we have a word for extreme shame or extreme embarrassment. But that can also lead to a moral. He was really embarrassed to even talk about doing that to such a small kid. Feeling pressures from your hierarchy to do things you know are wrong. This was kind of sort of the classic Jonathan Shea model. And if you think about the war he was studying, Vietnam, that makes sense, right? But does it really apply to other conflicts? Probably not to the extent that Vietnam did. And then belief that the world has changed or been revealed in such a way that you no longer feel at home. And I think when you get to the extreme forms of this, this can lead to thoughts of suicide. And there's evidence to suggest now that folks who, veterans and service members who have a strong sense of, of the world is just a place that I don't want to be a part of, that I don't fit into. They have huge increases in suicidal thoughts. Next slide. So there's this illness domain comprises that cognitive, emotional, physiological uh, reactions in our diagram. Disruptions in the illness domain can result in mental illness. That's why we call it the illness domain. But there's also this character domain that comp comprises the character and your identity that can also be impacted and that are often impacted. Disruptions here can range from moral slip, stains to injury. It can be both from, from, from characterized by character compromise, character flaws, character breakdown. And disruptions in identity can range. Again, these are terminologies and words that others have used. But the idea isn't an all or nothing. There's sort of this gradation. We've used these categories that others have used, but understand it as a continuum. These domains are separate, yet they interact. And I hope that I've given some examples of how that might happen. Next slide. So there are two sets of symptoms. So one thing that's important to understand is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of which PTSD is derived. They don't talk about the pathway. They simply say, here are the symptoms, and based on the symptoms, what is your diagnosis? What we argue is it's really important to understand the pathway as well, because the symptom overlap between moral injury and post-traumatic stress disorder is so tight that it's impossible to distinguish the two unless you understand the pathway that they're taken. And we also argue you can't simply do that from the event. Now, oftentimes you can learn a lot about the event, but you won't know if there's been a character or identity impact unless you assess for character and identity impact.
you'll just assume, oh, it's an event going through the illness domain, which is generally what, what happens. I've already mentioned that, that different symptoms can arise from both pathways, but often they're very similar. The clinical symptom domains things from cognitive emotions and physiology. In fact, many people talk about PTSD as a physiological disorder. I think that's an oversimplification. I think there's a very strong emotional component as well as a cognitive component. Just as there are strong cognitive and emotional components to a moral injury, the, the character domain pathway as well. Now, the symptoms impairment rise from different domains. They interact. Now, it's important to this last point. The interaction can either worsen the symptoms or it can lessen the symptoms. Okay? It depends. It depends on the nature of what, you're, of what the intervention is doing, and it depends on the nature of the reaction. So if you have grown from your experience having deployed, and say when you deployed, you saw very little trauma, but you did a lot of help with the local population, well, that experience will strengthen your character and actually provide protection against future traumatic events. Future traumatic events rarely protects you from, well, past traumatic events rarely protects you from future traumatic events. So I know there's this whole idea of resilience building by exposing people to potentially traumatic events. We had commanders, for example, in the States would take their soldiers to the morgue so they could see dead bodies. And the idea being that if I expose you to dead bodies, you'll be less shocked when you see them for real. Not that a real dead body in a morgue is not a real dead body. But when you're in a deployed environment, and therefore that would protect you from any deleterious effects of being around dead bodies. This was the idea. This is the old habituation idea. What that kind of training does and it could be useful. It allows you to perform your job when you're exposed to dead bodies in a deployed environment because you've seen a bunch of dead bodies previously. And you've gotten over the shock. You've gotten over. You've become comfortable being around dead bodies. But it doesn't necessarily protect you from the mental health issues that could arise from the trauma of, ex of seeing that. So habituation is not a protection against the mental health issue is, is the long and short of it. Next slide. Now, there was one box that I had there was called the sustaining forces. So what are things that we can do to sustain one's character and sustain one's mental health? So there are things that can be done. We think it's multi-level. It's done at the individual, peer, leader, and organizational level. And they can have direct effects on behavior. And it could be both interpersonal and interpersonal. So one of the things that's really becoming very much appreciated is the role of leaders in not only preventing the expression of post-traumatic stress disorder, but helping one recover from the adverse effects of trauma. And in this work is work that I have done, work that other people have done, showing that how your leaders respond when a member of the unit is killed, when a bad situation happens, they can be strong facilitators of recovering from traumatic events. And, and that's the contextual element to trauma. Remember I mentioned there's an event. Events are always done in a context. And what happens in the military if you kill the bad guy? Well, if you kill a lot of bad guys, we give you a medal right? And, and you're around to get it. Let's say you live to get it. It's not one of those posthumous awards. But if you kill a lot of bad guys, we give you a medal. So the organization is rewarding this killing, right? Which you would think, well, you know, that should be bad for you. Now, what happens if you accidentally kill a civilian? You're investigated if you're an American. We will investigate you to see why you killed that civilian. Now, I would argue being investigated for killing a civilian in a combat environment is detrimental. And sure enough, in a recent paper, actually Ben Porter took the lead on, 
showed that killing a non-combatant places you at higher risk for developing post-traumatic stress disorder than if you killed an enemy combatant. Now, another way of saying that is American soldiers were turned into killers, people who love to kill. But it's not that at all. It's just that we reward culturally and socially that behavior as leaders and as organizations. So you can see how the act of killing in and of itself is not as useful to understanding the expression of post-traumatic stress disorder and moral injury without understanding the social context in which it occurs. Next slide. So can character be developed? Just very briefly, two, I want to say I think there's two slides. Next slide. So independently of our work on thinking about moral injury as a disruption in character, the U United States Army has de been developing a framework for developing character in its subordinates, not to prevent moral injury. Okay, They were doing it because they understood that character is so fundamental to the organization and that people are going to have a character whether you try to influence its development or not. So the Army said, well, why don't we try to take a more active role in development of character? Now, this is the framework that, that the Army has come up with. But I just highlight, look at the individual. Identity is at the cornerstone of how they, too, are thinking about character development, consistent with all the literature on character and values and identity. I'm not going to go into the rest of this, but you can see there's a strong cultural element to it that I have argued is really, really important. And there's also the, the Army organization, so there's this climate around education training, of which you all are sitting as part of in the Canadian Defense Forces, right? So there's this sort of common approach or common understanding, I think, that folks are coming to about how you would address character development, although this is not being billed as a character development course, but I assure you, your character is being influenced by this training hopefully in a positive way, not in a negative way. But anyway, that's next slide. So here's their definition of character development. It's this continuous process. Again, I'm not going to read it. But what it does focus on is strengthens the resolve of trusted Army professionals to live by and uphold the Army ethic. So implied in this character development is upholding the Army ethics. So this is why it becomes really important how you, what is the Army ethics? And how are we going to operationalize it? And here, you know, they say values consistently faithfully demonstrated in decisions and actions. So you can see it's being, success is being determined not that, geez, I think that's wrong, but really based on what do you do? What kind of decisions do you make? So it's really being operationalized in behavioral terms, not just, geez, I think that's wrong, and then you do something else, right? So it's looking at really the behaviors. Next slide. So impl implications, I've already mentioned all of these, that one can suffer from a moral injury without having a mental illness, and vice versa, okay? One can suffer from a mental illness without having a moral injury, the time course differs. So our model basically says a moral injury will occur much later than the mental illness, what people would call delayed PTSD. I would call as probably moral injury. Okay, that's what the theory says. Now, you know, it's empirical. Like I said, it's probably wrong, but there's some testable pieces to it. We can see just how right or wrong it might be. Um, an illness will be quicker than a character change because it takes you a while to reflect. Is this the kind of person I am? No, I don't think I'm that kind of person. No, you really are that kind of person, right? Usually spouses and partners are really good at letting you know what kind of person you are uh, and how you might have changed as a result of your deployment. But we also think that strong character can ensure ethical behaviors, thus protecting against moral injury. Okay, this is the, the implication. Now, it's also possible that if you have too strong a character and when you don't live up to that identity of who you think you are, that that could lead to a much more intractable moral injury 
because you've, you have such high standards for yourself that you didn't live up to. So the dissonance is now greater, right? So one way of thinking about it, if you're a person of low character, you can basically engage in any behavior and not feel bad about it. But if you have high character, you can't engage in many behaviors without feeling bad about it. Okay, so this is the, this is the paradox. Next slide. So again, implications. If somebody has a moral injury, you need to focus in the character domain in terms of your interventions. If you have an illness, then you need to focus in the illness domain. And right now, every approach is really focused in the illness domain, one exception with the spirituality piece. Therefore, traditional psychotherapies probably aren't going to work. Data is emerging that actually suggests that that's true. Next slide. So again, corrective virtue. So we believe that, you know, and, the, and churches have figured this out, right? Churches for the last 10,000 years since religion emerged has figured this out. And what is this called? Penance, right? You go in, you confess. I, any Catholics in here? I was raised a Catholic. You do something bad. That's usually the moral injury part, quote, in quotes, Jeez, I'm sorry, I lied to my mother, I stole this. And you have penance. So you got to do the following things, and then you're all forgiven. Right? That's the corrective virtue that's being imposed. So religions have figured this out thousands of years ago. Right? Make restitution. Work in an orphanage. Do, do good deeds. Right? You don't have to be who you were, because you are what you currently are doing. Right? So you can make... And that rebuilds your character. That allows you to reclaim the identity that you think you've lost due to this one or two or several acts. Okay, next slide. That's simplified, right? Very simplified approach. So we need lots of research to sort of validate these key constructs, to see where the arrows go, to really elucidate the symptoms and impairments that re may result from disruptions in the character domain. Because there hasn't been any real work on this because people are always thinking about moral injury from a mental illness perspective. And, and, and also, I should say, to be fair, also a syndrome perspective as well, which is kind of the same thing. Next slide. So any questions or comments that if you want to email me, uh, I always say I prefer nice comments, but if you have some negative ones, I'm always happy to hear have you thought about this? This this doesn't agree with this. How would you explain that? Because this is a theory, and it's only going to be as good as the critiques and the criticism we get. We know it's not perfect, and it's an evolving it's an evolving framework. And I, I was just telling Stephen last night, we've already been tinkering and making changes to it already as we're as we're thinking about the implications of taking kind of this dual domain approach to it and not seeing it as a, a pathway or a continuum pathway or something that's added on, but really viewing it from two separate uh, frameworks. And who knows, there could be a third or fourth as well. Anyway, I'll stop there. Thank you.